Hi Bilon. Good morning Aditya. Good morning. Welcome to Sudhi Audio's channel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on it. We are happy to have such an experienced uh, sound engineer on the <laughs> channel with so many films to his credit. Thank you. Which the audience will soon figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bilon, a uh, typical question that you also get asked by a lot of Uncle, can you please tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how did you become a sound engineer what was that childhood journey influences in your growing up stage parental pressure blah 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 <laughs> so how did i start uh, i think my affinity for sound was it inculcated because of catholic family a lot of music uh, being exposed to so many different artists lp records were abundant Uh, dad was a singer and a musician so full time he, not full time uh, he he'd have like this 9 to 5 job but he'd practice with the paranjyoti choir which was one of the most esteemed choirs that kumi wadia used to uh, train and uh, conduct sorry so the influences of sound came from within the family i think uh, the transition to wanting to be an engineer happened from within me i found it more exciting to take things put them together uh, so engineering wise that was the first start i start right. tinkering and i think at 7 i blew up my first speaker okay and got beaten the shit out of because how would a 7 year old know that you don't put a speaker wire into the mains <laughs> So come that Sunday when, and so we had this huge Goodman's speaker at home, and this is one of the most personal stories to me. But here goes, uh, and it, my dad for some reason had a power plug on it, and I didn't know that it shouldn't be put into a mains. And yeah, so at seven it started, I guess. You know that I realized I want to tinker around with a lot of gear, so I would open up stuff and put it back together. And uh, I transitioned through the processes where I studied electronics. Uh, passed out, and who knew I'd get into audio? Uh, I didn't know because the first job that I was about to get was uh, with a shipping company, uh, and I had to go back and get a recommendation from my principal. And he said, "You want to?" He knew I was very interested in sound, so he said, "You know, if you want to follow me, trust me blindly. There's something that's up on the cards." but you can't ask me what you have to say yes and i said yes and so i started working with roger drago okay and that was like the first big thing that i did i mean as a rookie got to work with him and i couldn't ask for more because that was my dream job i wanted to work with roger that was there at the back of my head okay. you know sometimes you tend to make decisions because uh, i could have been on a ship mm. if i had got that recommendation because Uh, when you are 19 year old it's a job right. but there's this dream that you have i want to work with roger and it was there in my head and i guess from there on it's been a series of coincidences that i've been at the right place at the right time wanting to do certain things which were part of these dreams that i've had and so that's how the journey began a parental pressure is an important point because you know i see two sides to it there's a parental pressure and there's a family pressure okay. parental when you're not married and you have no responsibilities uh, and then there's this family that you acquire when you get married and you have a kid or kids and so there's these two pressures actually one is when i was starting off yeah my dad uh, i have these very long days because live gigs always are long hours you got to go early morning do your inventories prep for the show load everything get to the venue offload start to rig sound checks gig starts after you're done you just don't go home because you're a rookie you got to wait till last person leaves make sure everything that went out comes back in and you check so you're running 18 20 hour days uh, and it's not just go to the venue sound check and not at all i'm not i'm not the foh engineer i'm not the on stage mixer i'm i'm supposed to submit to this entire process of what i'm expected to do 
and uh, I think also because I never came from a sound background per se, I did not come from film school or from any institute that was teaching sound, I came from an electronics background and so I was learning all of these things way back in 94 when I started uh, where the internet was not so prominent. Uh, if you tried to do anything on the internet, you would take hours, right. Uh, reading a manual was not sufficient because you were learning on the job and I think enthusiasm is the key part of where I came from because if I had a dream, I was very, very keen to do this. Uh, uh, if someone told me it take two years, it take three years, I would be like I will do it in two months because I want to learn. So, being this end to cutlet that I was, I would spend very long hours at work. Uh, come home tired, exhausted, fall into bed and a couple of months later my dad would be checking my hands to see if I was doing some drugs. And yeah, so that is the only parental pressure I ever had, the worry of has this kid gone astray. Unfortunately, to most people's disappointments I guess, I have not done drugs or nor am I a smoker or a drinker. I think my passion is the work I do. Uh, it could be over passionate, but I do not want to define it because it is something that I love doing. Uh, what I want to jump further on into talking about is just the awareness of how a family needs to then sacrifice because of this passion. I think because now I am at a stage in life where I am able to do a lot of stuff, maybe quicker than most or maybe slower than most, it does not matter. But it is that responsibility that comes on to you where you need to balance between home and work and that is that is I think the tougher part than the parental pressure I faced. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Bilon, uh, what were your learnings with Roger Drago, you know, when, what did you kind of learn because at that age of 1920, you know, you have young blood and into like you still are. Yeah. Uh, but Anything that you can share where you know uh, people become come with a lot of arrogance these days you know to work the young audience. Unfortunately yes you are right uh, I think one of the and I, I often talk about this because yes 23 years later uh, I do see the lack of many of these attributes that some of us who came into the business had to have. Yeah, I was hot blooded, I was arrogant, I was hasty, uh, but with the intention of wanting to learn more, you know. It is like the kid who thinks in karate kid that he can be a karate expert in a blitz, but his master teaches him over time that you need to have the patience to do those exercises time and time again over and over day after day, week after week and after a couple of months you will learn the first thing. So, I think uh, humility is one thing that uh, I still feel is the most important attribute that one needs to have. The humility to know uh, that when you introduce me as someone who has done a lot of films, filmmakers who work with me for the first time always realize that it is my first film. I have never felt the need to have the baggage of over 100 films behind me. Uh, I do not have that baggage. So every film is like a first time for you. It is like a reset, start from zero. All that I am carrying forward is an experience. Uh, I do not have any more baggage that I need to carry over. Uh, and Every filmmaker, the most inexperienced of them, for example, it could be a kid from out of a college who's approached me to help, or uh, it could be anybody with the lack of any knowledge that I have. I still have those butterflies in my stomach, and I think I need to have those butterflies in my stomach because that's when I give my best to that person, and I treat that person as if he was making a film for the hundredth time, because you know. Uh, not everyone knows what they want from sound. Sometimes even I do not know what I can give out. So, I need to tap into the simplicity of what I am looking at from the person I am working with to be able to understand in his head what is there. 
it would be justified to sometimes say okay the filmmaker doesn't know anything at all which is great because then i can tap still tap into my own resource to kind of find something that goes oh wow it's so nice it's not about how great the sound effect was as much as how the design evolved and for me designs everything right it's it's dialogue effects music all blending together together into this mix so i think that's one attribute that most people lack today humility second comes perseverance i want to be but we live in an age where you want to be something and it's you know 15 minutes later you are and then what happens after that it's a sustenance that it's a sustainability right you can be what you wanted to be like okay i've achieved so much and then i had to sustain that i've had to make sure that uh, this core that i have as a person sustains for the next 10 years after and there's something that i'm doing with the content i'm working on sometimes i fail sometimes i succeed i could have excuses but how do i how do i retain uh, the innocence of what i come with and not lose it to the pressures that come from within the industry so i need to persevere i need to be persistent with it which is something i find lacks today uh, the gift of being given something a responsibility delegated down to you the expectation of you not running away when the going gets tough so with rojo with sham uh, at crest communications with central at real image all of these people entrusted you with a lot of responsibility and i think because i didn't come from film school this responsibility was a huge pat on the back which also came with the understanding that you need to be a little more practical uh, you need to approach it with a lot of more sensibility you have to it's like you're investing in me i'm going to give you dividends back i took it rather too seriously okay. and i felt it's very important for me not to let these people down uh, and that sense of understanding for me actually is the gratitude i have for these people because if it hadn't been given to me uh, nobody i mean i don't have the academics to justify what i do today so we had to learn in a business where a lot of knowledge was not available we had to learn from our peers also if i was disrespectful to my peer he would never teach me i've learned the hard way I, i've obviously you know with the hastiness with the arrogance you you had to tone the monkey down also so so uh, there's a lot of gratitude to these people because without them i can't share the success of what i must be today i don't even know i don't i can't even fathom the impact i have on anyone or any buddy in the business but uh i can't take it if there's something good about it i can't take it as my own i have to share it with a lot of people who been uh, very instrumental in me getting here it's nice for you also to remember them and have that gratitude because it's becoming a rare commodity of sorts yeah. besides your uh, rookie days you know that where you learned everything right from carrying stuff yeah. on the stage yeah. packing and packing yeah. 15 18 hours a day i'm sure outside bombay travels also yeah uh what then uh did you kind of take up as did you stick to being in the foh or yeah that area or did you switch to something else so uh, i think thanks to parental pressure so my dad worked for a government company he had a lovely 9 to 5 job a uh, lot of public holidays or uh, lta and uh, what privilege leave and all of these benefits which would accumulate into 200 days so <laughs> that was the that's my expression of parental pressure so these long hours were kind of beginning to have an effect on this household that was running to make them happy i finally quit 
and I was in limbo for three months because I worked with another company that was closer to the field I came from, electronics. And I was doing exciting stuff because I was doing R&D, uh, but it was really boring. It, it, it was really boring and so I saw this ad in the paper because you'd go through the paper and see you know, whoever puts an ad for an audio guy. And I stumbled upon this ad from Crest Communication, it was really big. Uh, ad they were expanding from the small outfit that they were into this really bigger uh, public limited company and I applied and I got in uh, and uh, I soon discovered that this is a company that was into post production it was very alien to me I had no clue it's just that I knew my business very well and none of them did so I guess that worked to my benefit <laughs> Uh, and again, you know, I, I figured out the people who were around me and I latched on to every single one. So, uh, strangely, the whole idea of quitting Roger was to go to this systemized corporate world, right, of fixed timings. And the first day I went to work, I didn't go home in the night oh. because they were doing graphics and I was like, wow. And so I made friends with these guys and they would be like, okay, this is not working and that, any random stuff that was not working. And I'd be like, okay, I'll fix this and I'll fix that. And so I soon started to, you know, latch on to all of these things that were happening, whether it was editing on the low band and somebody was doing work there, walk in and figure out that a speaker was not fine or some mixer cable was not fine. And I just, what do you want next? And what do you want next? And what do you want next? And I, I just started embracing all of these stupid things that you'd call you know repairing cables or I don't know I can't remember all of these details I never looked back from there because I think unconsciously something r dawned on me that I love sound and I love this world I'm immersed in uh, and very soon I think Sham figured this out and uh, he took me under his wing so by the time I was 21, I was I was taken care of by this man and his wife Seema and whatever that he called me to do, I would always say yes. That's the one thing I learned, you know, I'd finish off all my work and I know he'd call me on my, on my line and tell me, ask me, where are you now? What are you doing? I said, I'm doing this. Okay, when are you getting free? I'll get free in this time. You'll finish all your work and come. What are we doing? We're setting up the Oxbury scanner. We're setting up the DVNR. Sounds coming in late over there. And I would not know a lot of like the Oxbury scanner. I had no clue what the heck am I sitting here and seeing him doing. But I think the enthusiasm of just wanting to know mm. is something that it's like a mutual fund. It's paid so much of dividends along the way, might have relevance to my life now or not, is immaterial. Uh, so, but it shaped you. It shaped me. It it taught me that even today, if someone calls up and says, "What are you doing? Can you help? I have a problem. I won't turn somebody down who's even if it means I don't have to work on it. I'm still very happy to help someone if you're stuck in a jam because I think that experience that's come from the last twenty years can't be taken away. So yeah, that was the next jump. I kind of realized I got into post production. And I started working on stuff that was meant for television and then realized very quickly television was in my deal. It was film and it is film and so that, that kind of that slow graph moved very fast and I started to work on film uh, on the audio vision which was uh, one of the workstations from Avid which would allow you to digitize picture and we had 8 tracks of audio. A lot of filmmakers back then would be, you're crazy, how can film work on a, like you digitize and it goes, it becomes 25 frames, so this 24, 25. So I think also with that, you learned all the different things that happen with this format interchange and nothing really is happening with the picture. All the myths of when you were called a heretic, right? How can film work on a workstation? It's not going to happen. So I was again lucky. I, I, I kind of worked my way through that uh, timeline that was happening with the digital era. Uh, films would go out sync and then you realize oh the out syncs were happening in between scenes in a reel because the edits 
someone didn't match the clap back properly and a lot of small, 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 small problems, you know, you were learning on the fly and debugging so that two years later or three years later, you were now teaching people all the mistakes that were happening when we were all working on different platforms. But I never looked back from there. I think then I kind of figured the film is where I want to be. That's where the magic really happens. Uh, yeah. Nice.